Welcome to yet another interactive day of ICRC 2K20, a platform for the exchange of ideas and thoughts. Today is the concluding day of our conference, and we hope you're finding the conference very informative and interactive. I, architect Diksha Sharma, will be the host for the lecture series today. Last two days, we had thoughtful paper presentations by the researchers, and we got to interact with eminent speakers and discuss the issues and challenges like urban plurality, conservation of historic towns, preservation and redevelopment of fringe areas, slum rehabilitation and redevelopment, inclusive planning for informal sectors, study of Indian street morphology, etc. Today on day three, we have with us Dr. Nizamuddin Ahmed from Bangladesh, sharing the platform with architect Krishna Rao Jaisam from India. Dr. Nizam graduated in 1979 and completed his Master of Architecture in 1984 from Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology. Professor Dr. Nizamuddin Ahmed has taught architecture for over three decades and bang at Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology and is a former dean and head, specialized in industrial buildings, acoustics, and means of escape in fire. Dr. Ahmed did his PhD and postdoctoral research at the University of Sheffield, England. He has written six books on various topics related to industrial architecture, acoustics, fire safety, and urbanism. Dr. Nizam excels in the profession as well with many projects of repute, including the Bangladesh University of Professionals, MIST Hostel for Men and Women, Kurmitola Golf Club Clubhouse, Apex Footwear First Factory Building, Rangamati Waterfront Resort, and under construction Bari Bateswar Museum. Dr. Nizam is decorated with Bangladesh's highest scout award, the Silver Tiger. On behalf of ICRC 2K20, I welcome you, sir. Dr. Nizam would be talking on a very interesting research work of his, beginning from the end, a case for returning to the village, global education research awareness motivation for impacting rural architecture. Without taking much time, I would like to welcome Dr. Nizam on board. But before that, I would request our audience to drop your questions in the chat box. We'll read them out to Dr. Nizam at the end of the presentation. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much for having me. Salam and greetings from Bangladesh. Uh, international conference on rediscovering cities it may bode well for the citizens the communities and the countries to pause and ponder on our villages my presentation beginning from the end a case for returning to the village Geram Fira Geram in uh, Bangla means uh, village and Fira means going back, so Geram Fira is going back to the village. Expanding the acronym Geram Fira, G for global, G for education, and so on, research awareness motivation for impacting rural architecture. The concept of Geram Fira is based on the premise that there is an architectural divide. Architects are and have been obliging the urban environment, serving the well-to-do minority, while ignoring the rural areas and discounting the majority. The focus of architecture schools has also been the urban area, and the architect has basically been the urban form maker. To democratize architecture, we have to engage the mainstream, ensure improved lifestyle for the majority of people of any country, enhance their housing, education, and health facilities, living and working conditions. About 70% plus minus people in Bangladesh live in rural areas. The remaining 20% plus minus live in the cities, but then 
even among them, there are people who are destitute in dire need of food, shelter, clothing, education, health. It may be noted here that about 10% of buildings worldwide are made, are designed by architects. And about 10% are constructed based on local traditions and local know-how with local materials and the technology. To democratize architecture, it is necessary for architects and allied professionals, engineers, planners, policy makers to get involved with the forgotten mainstream. Architecture has to be for the people, by the people, of the people. Bangladesh is not a very large country in land area. It is of the size of uh, the state of Odisha in India. But even in this, within this small patch of land, there are wide variations of the house form, which is my point that local environment, people, religion, society, culture have a great impact on the house form. The indigenous dwellings in Bangladesh are human response to the local environment. They are made with locally available and affordable materials. Affordable is most important here. And they are made by native and intuitive technology. No help from us. Constructed by local craftspeople, sometimes with little help from the neighbors and also the homeowner. But the most important thing is that they exude strong local influences, that is culture. The top right picture on my slide is from central Bangladesh in Gazipur. Here the houses are made of mud and thatched roof. The lower right is from southwest, the Chittagong hill tracks. Here the houses are made mainly of bamboo, which is abundantly available there. The lower left is a biased picture because that is my village. This is from Southeast Bangladesh, Greater Borishal, Piroshpur. So this is on the canal. And these, these houses are made of wood, which is available there. And the roof is made of gold pata in our Bengali terms. In English, it's called Nipa palm, Nipa puticans, I think is the botanical name. So as you can see in my small landed country, there are these three variations and there are many more. And if you search in India, you'll find maybe thousands. Every 20 miles, 25 miles, there will be a variation based on the local impact of the influences, the elements that play on house. The issue of Gram Fera is that educated urban youths have shunned their villages and ancestral roots. Thereby, they have denied rural people of their knowledge and are themselves deprived of the rich and rural culture that exists in the villages even today. The other issue is that wealthy owners, politicians, uh, business people, when they go back to the village, they build their house in the idyllic conditions. But unfortunately, they imitate erroneously the urban form. They import inferior building elements from the city. They utilize high energy and expensive materials. They destroy the long-standing fabric of the countryside. These pictures are from our villages. And they care very little for people, context, economy, society, or culture. They are like aliens from the city landed on the village, their own village. Garam Fera is a non-governmental organization, non-political, not-for-profit. 
and is based on the principle, principle of human welfare. We are hoping to engage urban and rural youths to interactively participate hands-on in rural architectural activities. Our interest areas are building, community space, economy, technology, and population. We believe that any degree of improvement for the villages would benefit the people. And this need not remain limited to our village or my village. The adopted measures, the design decisions, participatory models, and the interaction uh, between the people and the rural urban technology transfer could be a guidance for such deprived population elsewhere. India, this whole, whole of South Asia, any country. And such measures would counter the global menace of destroying the countryside in the name of modernization and development. The urban youth via Geram Fera, working alongside the rural people in the rustic environment with indigenous materials and technology, will develop further love for their country and people because we are thinking of taking or luring our urban youth to the village to participate in something that is buildable. When they go to the village, we are hoping that they will love their country more and they will want to serve the people whom they will have touched while building something and vice versa and perhaps most importantly these urban youth will not not opt to migrate permanently to an alien country rural houses today are without architecture. They're devoid of modern building knowledge. Their durability is uncertain. They are denied the services of the architect. They are an endangered species. They need to be understood, the houses. They need to be preserved, the huts. And these buildings need to be procreated. The rural youth via Garam Fera will be working alongside the urban youth. They will discover more about globalization, about universal thinking, information technology, and new techniques to make traditional materials more durable. The greatest beneficiary of this interaction, urban-rural youth interaction, will be the country. And there will be the possibility of reduced human capital flight to developed countries. The countryside architecture, on the other hand, will be protected by people working together when they understand the importance of preserving their heritage, their culture. You will not believe, but this is a building in my village. This is not what we want. This is my village. Even now, there is a need for education to, to rediscover the connection between nature and human capabilities, the potentialities of each. And we need, they need to mutually up the human habitat and the natural environment. It's reciprocal. If you save the human habitat, you save the environment. If you save the environment, you save the human habitat. If we kill the habitat, then we kill the environment. There are two sides in this game, the rural dwellers and us professionals. Education, formal and informal, for them and for us, will help us to attain 
the relevant knowledge and facilitate information exchange. Research is necessary to make rural building materials and technology more durable and affordable. Make rural buildings more comfortable. Research shall explore the means of preserving rural characteristics while enhancing the living conditions, the working conditions. We shall have to investigate the influence of the environment, the cultural variances that I have shown, the religion, the impact of religion, the impact of tradition, the values on shelter and space, as well as on adjoining areas. We have to try to understand the potentiality of transferability beyond political boundaries. The village in Bangladesh does not stop at our border with India. It travels across the border for maybe another 10 miles. The architecture of Indian villages transfer over to our villages, maybe 10 miles, 20 miles. So there is a gray area where the two countries are having a common architecture. We need to understand why. It is because of the culture, the language, the heritage they share. We have to build awareness to disseminate this information about humanity, the building environment and globalization by all possible means, especially to our villages and about the village to our urban youth. We have started with the youth because grown-ups have their fixed state of mind and maybe the youth are more malleable. So we have to seek solutions to the needs of the community. So real human contact, let the youth from the city go to the village with a purpose, not to visit their grandparents or their uncles, but to build something for their fellow countrymen and then gain appreciation for culture. But we will need to motivate the people, to stimulate both the urban and rural people on the need to develop the rural areas from within, but with globally available technology. Internet is available in all our villages. We just need to give them a hand about the building technology and let them know why we think to preserve their heritage and culture is important. We have to involve the community to various welfare activities, to make them interested, to motivate them, encourage private and institutional involvement of mainly students of architecture, planning and engineering. Other students are most welcome to participate in community projects as a charitable undertaking so that they can understand the issue of Garam Fera, why our villages are being wasted, why our environment is being degraded. And we have to design the facility, we meaning the urban and the rural youth. They will design the facility themselves and they will construct the building themselves and hand over the project to the villages. Garam Fera program is based on three modules. The first module is Urban Rural Architectural Linkage, Ural, which is a Bengali word, which means flight. This is a city-based model where we are inviting youths of the city, the students of the city, to learn about the villages, history, culture, hygiene, health, building materials, technology, rural women and children, how to live minimally, about the war of liberation that has taken place in the villages, agriculture, economy, community service, volunteerism, media and the rural development, rural architecture, rural, rural arts and crafts. They are very rich and our youth need to know about this so that they can love their country, about the natural calamity and disasters that take place in our rural areas. And they have to commit 
that being in the first module, they must come and participate in the third module. The second module is for the villages, the youth of the villages, the village. This module is rural inquiry into architecture and living. Real, real. This is the ground reality. Here, the youth of the village will be invited to a seminar to discuss about history, culture, religion, agriculture, planning, building materials, the role of family and women, information communication, health hygiene, public health, rural architecture, youth involvement in development. Perhaps they are seen on television, on the net, on the social media, but they need to be told that you, the village youth, have a role to play in saving your village. The question of volunteerism is of course there, and they have to also make a commitment to visit the third module, which is rural urban technology transfer by sharing. The youths of village and the city will share their knowledge gained through the two modules and also their personal knowledge. Besides these seminars, they have their own knowledge. They are about 18, 20, 24 years old. So in routes where this rural urban technology transfer uh, sharing routes spelled a bit differently, but it means going back to the routes. And the participants of the two modules will understand the issue, design the building, and build and transfer the building to a community. And this will be elected with maximum maximum indigenous materials and know-how. Karam Fera, we have to fund the project and the uh, beneficiary community organization will also share the costs. So if it's 10 costs, five will be Garam Fera, five will be the beneficiary public welfare organization. Now model three, is easier said than done. It is actually the most difficult part because we have to source our Garam Fera fund. We are an organization which is non -for, not for profit. And we have to select a suitable partner organization, something uh, uh, neutral. But we have to have a land. And this is also very difficult. An organization having a land and also to be also willing to accommodate the Garam Fera design because that is the main purpose of this uh, also one of the main purpose of this exercise is to uh, have an impact on the rural architecture and they will have to share the costs but we are happy to note that we are getting some partners few are then fewer than uh, we would have expected. But then we are hoping that we can build a Garam Fera Bhavun at Kola Khali Union in Pirospur district, that is my district. And this will be designed mainly with wood and Golpata. Golpata is a Nipah palm, uh, very much available in uh, Shundarbans, also the part uh, of Shundarbans that is in West Bengal, India. They also have Golpata. And these uh, materials are in harmony with the local tradition. These are like small, uh, these are like large coconut trees, but the stem is very short. That is the gold path of tree in their prime. And when they are ripe, we use the leaf as a, a roofing, roofing material, uh, like that, seen in the picture on the right. And this building that we have designed will be built, we have, meaning the youths have been designed actually, the city youths. They will uh, uh, build this building hands-on and they will uh, be camping at the site, the city youths, so that they can have a sense of feeling about their own country, which they have not visited for last maybe five, ten years. I asked my class of 50, how many have you visited your village in the last one year? Ten hands up. How many have you visited, visited in the last five years? One hand up. So you see, People have stopped going to the village. So we, through Gram Fera, are trying to lure our youth to the village with a purpose. 
and these campers the youth with have the opportunity to lend a hand to the local mason to carpenter electrician plumber and gardener we are not expecting them to build from scratch but building will be coming up and they'll be camping uh, peri periodically for two days three days four days and another set of boys and girls will go to replace the previous set of boys and girls and so on this is the plan of the building at Kuala Khali Piroshku. The central space is a multi-purpose hall, about 14 meters by five and a half meters. This is a multi-purpose hall. It has got three small rooms to, attached to the, uh, to the sides. These will act as offices and also uh, hobbies rooms and uh, vocational uh, training room. There will be ob obviously a toilets for men and women. There will be two uh, staircases. The one staircase will lead up to the upper floor above the multi-purpose room and the other staircase will lead to above the toilets where we have another common space. This uh, uh, floor area of the space is about 154 square meters. The upper floor has the multi-purpose hall two-thirds of the multi-purpose hall has double height space the part covered is a library which has a veranda which is very traditional in this part of bangladesh it's called top veranda meaning above and there will be also two rooms attached on the sides the green there you go with the staircase and that's it this floor is about 54 square meters if you look at the elevation this is the north entry elevation entrance the top veranda on the right and uh, with a slope roof a fish roof let a, a little little use of bricks and uh, local bricks will use made there there are brick kilns even in our village The pride and satisfaction we are hoping the participants will have should be unbound once we have the building in place. This is a 3D view of the project that we are about to start constructing at Kuala Hali. This is yet another view, a sort of bird's eye view. You can see on the left, the top veranda hanging out. The, the uh, entry is a bit wide. That's where people all gather, social gatherings, sit on the steps. Uh, we have a rain harvesting thing. You can see the blue batch of water. So we are hoping that uh, this will excite the people in and around the village to do something different and not build houses like we have in the cities. In conclusion, we can say that these pilot projects, we are hoping to make several, will be able to demonstrate that if there is appropriate research and cooperation between the city and the rural people, youth professionals and rural people, and obviously funding, we can go nowhere without fund. It is possible. The architects and the community can come together to create architecture that can help perhaps build a wo world that is different and will make a world of a difference for the benefactor and the receiver. On behalf of the majority of the people of Bangladesh and India and of any country our uh, similar economies on behalf of the majority of the people i thank you very much for having me beginning from the end there is hope in every new beginning thank you thank you sir Thank you for sharing such informative research work of yours. It seems we all have had a trip down to the villages of Bangladesh 
with intensive knowledge about indigenous materials and practices very precisely you have discussed the concept and the experience of global education research awareness motivation for impacting rural architecture um let's start with the question and answer round the first question sir for you i'll read it out to you does motivating people become a challenge it's a very short question but it has to have a very long answer because uh, it is not easy to motivate people who have a fixed set of mind see the adults in the village will not perhaps listen to me and uh, the people who can really help the politicians and the business people the moneyed people even the people in the village they are not building seven story 10 story buildings in even my village so what will happen is that if we can motivate if we can have a a movement a youth movement like a scout movement or a rotary movement or a worldwide you know uh, leo movement uh, if there is a movement where the youths make a lot of noise that yes this is what we want in this village we have built this in other village we have uh, built that and you will be surprised to know maybe you already know that my idea after i i tried to evolve these ideas on my own i when i went to the net i was surprised to see that these uh, concepts uh, are, exist even in australia in uh, very developed countries like uh, the usa where they have uh, projects for villages in the universities and they actually build them like i i believe it's the university of ohio they have a final year project uh, the best three are built and they have a third year project where only one of the best is built so our universities can actually have a project in third year in the final year where we emphasize on our students that come on let's not have only atomic reactors and resource and uh, 30 50 60 storied buildings cultural uh, what is the complexes made of concrete and bricks let's do something in a village with the thing of the village for the people of the village so if we can have several examples in several villages i believe the answer to your short question is yes it will be a challenge but the challenge can be met by the youth who are the real actors in this project adiksha yaar thank you so much sir very well answered another question for you can such module be taken to the cities as well cities have our cities i not say so much as true for india because on my multiple visits to various projects i've seen that there is uh, even in sri lanka sri lanka there is a uh, something like a home grown uh, style coming up or have been there for quite some time in uh, bangladesh we are yet to have that home grown thing we are gradually going there some of our architects have built uh, uh, schools uh, a masjid uh, with uh, local things uh, thoughts but i believe that we are being uh, influenced by this jet set uh, technology Uh, this aluminium and glass uh, culture we build a, a university 15 storied university facing the west which is our sun and the entire facade is made of glass and then we are having to think come on put up curtains uh, put up uh, uh, boards so we are really on the wrong track so i appreciate the question that yes it is also perhaps necessary to imbue our city architects and uh, uh, city builders the owners the clients that hey let's not import everything from everywhere else let's try and do something which is bangladesh i think uh, this sort of uh, education motivation awareness is also necessary for clients in our Uh, cities but it's not uh, easy because you see one of my clients he started a meeting with me office building he goes to the board and he draws an angle 
I was very encouraged. He says, don't do this. No angles in my building. I want only a building which is covering my entire land. I want to build maximum. The problem is with uh, our clients, I don't blame them. The land is so expensive that uh, they have to try and make ma uh, maximum use of it. But then with the introduction of uh, FAR uh, policy in Bangladesh uh, since 2006, uh, we are, uh, I think, making um, uh, more inroads into having uh, different shapes and sizes of buildings. So I hope uh, in the next uh, one or two decades, we'll be having something different. Right, sir. Thank you for answering that one. Another question for you is, slum areas are mostly ignored while developing villages and cities. It impacts both cities and villages in many scales. What, according to you, is the solution for slum areas? Slums are actually victims or beneficiaries of push and pull factors. Slums are there. We have hundreds of slums. And uh, some of them are burnt or we suspect put on fire to free the land to make a building. You will have seen uh, many uh, Indian films uh, on this concept, the slums being burnt. But this is not a filmy idea. It is, in fact, the reality. Slums are burnt to make space for new buildings. Now, money talks. If they have no money, they are burnt to make space for people who have money. Now, the government has a role to play here. There are uh, several uh, NGOs in Bangladesh also. Uh, doing uh, studies uh, on the slum areas, but they are mainly about providing them with uh, uh, water supply and uh, sanitary uh, facilities, uh, education for the children, etc. To build, uh, we need money. And I think uh, we are far from uh, having that sort of a government uh, commitment or a situation where we can uh, build uh, for the slum dwellers. We sometimes have built in the past, uh, I forget the name of the place, uh, it's in Tongi. Uh, it's called, uh, I, I hope I can remember, but I can't. It was meant for the uh, slum dwellers, but uh, it was soon taken over by people who had more money than the slum. So they, saw, they have to sell it off. So I think uh, even in other countries, there have been projects where the government uh, did make uh, houses uh, we had once, uh, we had some areas in Mirpur where in, in uh, pre uh, liberation time we had uh, some uh, small one story, two story buildings made for in the Mahmudpur, Mirpur area. But they were also sold to people who had more money. So I think uh, in a free country where people can uh, buy and sell, it's very difficult uh, to do what uh, you were suggesting. I, I think this is uh, in our heart. We all want uh, a very nice uh, living uh, space for our slum dwellers. But uh, while providing water, education, health, and the hygiene conditions are easier, uh, building a house for them is difficult. And the greater difficulty is for them to uh, hold on to it, to ha have it, because uh, the mechanism the system is not in place where they can uh, maintain that house that they have been uh, uh, given so i think it's a, it's a lot of a uh, lot to do with uh, uh, having their employment their uh, salaries uh, income uh, increased even our uh, garment workers i mean they are also unable to afford very decent uh, housing conditions so perhaps if there are some institutional uh, uh, interferences, positive interferences, initiatives, I would, I would say, if the government uh, owners, and some of them have done it, even in the industrial uh, uh, revolution of England, uh, Dan Ownby and some other uh, uh, factory owners, 
they had uh, complexes where they made uh, houses for their uh, factory workers. So I believe that could be one uh, solution if the owners of factories, if they can buy a patch of land, donate it on a system where the uh, owners, uh, where the factory workers become owners by paying a monthly installment. So it's all about uh, commitment, about uh, the mentality of the people, of the owners, of the people who have money uh, to take such an initiative. It is difficult. That very well answers the question, sir. Okay, moving on to the next question. What are the building materials used in last shown remote project? Well, the, we are used, uh, um, this is in uh, Piroshpur, uh, Kola Khali. There's a small uh, village by the side of a river. So we have, uh, uh, we are using wood because uh, uh, in our village, uh, which is uh, just on the fringe of Shundurbans, so we get a lot of, lot of wood. All our houses, even my own village house, is made of wood uh, with a, a CI sheet uh, or a industrial uh, metal uh, roofing. So uh, previously it was made of uh, gold pata, that is a nipa palm. So the roofing material is nipa palm and the uh, body of the building, the sides will be walls, will be made of uh, wood, uh, even uh, wooden uprights, uh, which don't go into the earth because that will um, uh, be uh, rotting. So they are actually uh, sitting on a, the, the, the wooden uprights are actually sitting on a plinth of brick, like a table. And then uh, we have a little bit, little bit of uh, use of bricks. So it's it's a wood, brick, and a roof of Nipapa. Thank you for telling that, sir. Next question for you is: What about understanding the structure of a village and its surroundings? Does the lifestyle of villagers can be adopted by urban dwellers unless they are ready to change? When we had our first multi story buildings, like four story buildings in the 60s, there are stories like people uh, were pushing their cow and goat to the top floor because they were actually farming these uh, domestic animals in their uh, one storied houses. So that sort of uh, culture has now been totally eroded. Uh, people do not uh, have cattle in their city houses now. So city uh, has its own uh, system of working and people have to uh, adapt to it. And so I don't think it's, uh, it's possible uh, to adopt uh, village lifestyle in the city, unless it is done uh, intentionally, uh, designed by the architect, a very innovative architect can actually think of such a, a cluster of houses where there are a lot of interaction. But as you will know, in our apartment buildings, true for Bangladesh and India, the next door uh, neighbor doesn't know that uh, his or her neighbor has expired uh, the night before. So this is the uh, social condition, uh, unfortunate situation in our countries nowadays. Uh, we are far from the community style of uh, social cultural living of the villages. We have completely moved away. Uh, we are, uh, I don't know if, if you can say that we are machines, but uh, I, I think we are, I mean, we are, very, we are terrible. I mean, we are, we have done everything that can be done to erase humanity from us. And architects have a role to play to make humanize our buildings, humanize our society. But we have fallen prey to uh, industrialization, to the styles that we see in magazines. Our magazines are also responsible for uh, polluting the minds of our young architects as students because, and maybe uh, us as teachers, 
that's why I said that if we can somehow include within our syllabus in the city, we have uh, rural planning in our syllabus. We don't have rural architecture as such. There should be projects in our village because they are the majority. So if we are building houses to lure them, we are actually pulling everybody to the city. We need to do something so that people can feel that, yes, there are good things in the villages. Let's go back. There are good things in the villages. Let's adopt them. But who is going to do it? If it's going to be done by a built form, it has to be done by architects. And we have to think out of the box and out of the box and out of the box twice, threefold because we have come that far away from making our buildings a part of our soul. We have lost that thing in our building. We are making buildings, as I said, that the building I'm sitting now in Dhaka, a moneyed man will go to the village and make a building just like this with electrical lights, fans, air conditioners, uh, what is it called, microwave oven, everything is there. So I think it's, it, 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 it requires a revolution because we have come a long, long way from our villages. And that could be one of the main problems of our cities, the kind, the, our behavioral pattern with our neighbors. We look away when we see somebody uh, known on the street. Uh, maybe he'll ask me something, oh my God. Let me look the other way. In the villages, it's not like that. In the villages, you perhaps will go and embrace that person or that person will go and complain to your father. Hey, your son crossed me and he didn't give me a salam. What's wrong with him? Is he, has he become so important? I mean, in the city, that doesn't work. The, the thing you are asking still maybe to some extent exists in our old cities. If you will notice carefully what the Mahalla concept is there, Mahalla, as we say in Bangla, I don't know if it's good for Hindi, I hope it is. So in a Mahalla, in a community in the old city, that threading is still there. That structure is still there. But every elder is keeping an eye on the youth. The youths are aware that I cannot smoke because my chacha is down there. My mama is looking from that window. So let me move away. So this sort of uh, respect for elders and all huddling together to help someone. If somebody dies, the whole community comes forward to uh, do the washing, the cleaning, the burial, the prayer. Everything is done. Uh, this is true for any community in Bangladesh. I, I mean, a Muslim community, a Hindu community, a Buddhist community, because they are living in the old city where that threading is still there. The bids of fraternity, the bids of feeling for each other, they are still tied by a string, which is completely severed in a city. I agree to that, sir. A good suggestion, including in the curriculum at a very young age, would bring a positive change. Another question, sir. In a scenario where the World Wide Web has spread to villages, and now we may even have Google employees operating from a village in Bangladesh too, how will, how will the lifestyle be addressed by the proposal? Uh, these are actually two different things. One is his employability. He's employed in doing something. He, he can be an artist. He can be a uh, uh, Google uh, employee. But we are talking about what sort of house form he should have, what sort of relationship he or uh, she should have with uh, uh, his uh, neighbors. So even while working for a web company, he can have an environment which is totally rural or which has semblance of uh, rural conditions. The environment has been respected. Uh, it's been um, organic. There is a, a inside, outside. Uh, the outside of the 
environment has been somewhat brought into the inside. The inside has flown to the outside. Uh, this is his house. This is his office in the village. So having that condition, he can be working or he can be the owner of a multi-billion dollar uh, industrial uh, complex or uh, company. Doesn't matter. It is where he is working, where he is living that we are trying to change. He can work anywhere. Uh, he, there can be ATM, ATM machines. There can be telemedicine in the village. No problem. We are not against technology. We have to accept technology, obviously. But we are saying that by eroding everything so quickly, I think we are destroying uh, the countryside and we are uh, also damaging the society. So, so he can be employed for a very high tech job, but he can live uh, in rustic conditions in a very well designed house or office which has respected his environment. I mean, in that city, it's not possible to respect anything because you have a patch of land and there's already possibly a house on your right, on your left, and behind, and maybe a nine meter road in front of you. So that's your environment. And there is no east, west, north in, in um, some places. The wind doesn't play, the sun doesn't play. But in the villages, still, there are situations where the environment plays on the space that we are designing. So if we start now and make create examples, perhaps when our city planners will think of making the next housing complex, they will try to have some uh, thought on the density, on the ratio, on the open area, on the, you know, in the, there are there have been uh, open areas and uh, lakes in many housing areas. I don't know about India, but in Bangladesh, in some places, they have been taken over, built, and uh, the uh, lake has uh, shrunk because some influential person wanted a land, so he was given a lakeside uh, property. So this happens in uh, our uh, kind of uh, uh, society culture. So if we can learn from the village and if we do not further damage the villages, perhaps we still have some hope to begin from the end. That's why I'm saying that my Garamfera, our Garamfera believes in beginning from the end because we think that the end is somewhat already there, which I, I should not say being an optimistic uh, architect. But the thing is that to emphasize on the point that we have gone so far down that the end is reached. Now we have to perhaps begin from that end to have any impact on our society, on our culture, on our architecture. Very well explained, sir. We'll just take another question. Uh, rural development is becoming urbanized because of the changing aspirations and mindset. How to address that? Well, I think I, uh, in my uh, paper and my response to some of the questions, uh, I have covered like uh, what uh, is going to happen. Because yes, the rural, when they build a hospital, they are building a six-storied building or a school, three-storied building. But you'll see the irony is that the buildings which win awards in our cycle of awards, many of them are buildings in the style that we are talking about. They are low. They are good responses to the environment. They are utilizing low energy. Uh, they come with the uh, green architecture. They satisfy that. So if we are talking about rural development in the peri-urban areas, development will be there. It's money, it's uh, economy. But if, like, if projects like Garamfera can also be emulated in India or in other countries. And if we can set up examples in some villages in 
two examples in one village, three examples in another village. Let people look at that building, visit that building, learn from that building. Even if 20%, 25% of that awareness is in that person or the architect, when he builds the next building in the city or in the villages, perhaps we are going somewhere because we can't stem the tide overnight by one simple project. We have to think that it may take decades, but if we press the brake now, we'll still be going accelerating up to a point, but then maybe there will be a time when we will slow down and we will be thinking that yes, there is something called a village. And so that is why I'm saying that architects uh, and the young architects, young engineers, uh, students of architecture, engineering, I mean, they should be lured to visit the villages. They have, you, you can ask any of the students in your city, how many of them have visited their villages? Many of them don't have villages now. 50 years back, every Indian, every Bangladeshi had a village. Where is your village? Well, my village is Gurgao. My village is, well, mine was in, my, mine is Shuti Yakati, I used to say. Now, many city people don't have a village. Well, no, we don't have. My grandparents have died, we have sold. Many people in my village have sold their ancestral houses because they don't have any intention to maintaining the root. If somebody does not believe in his roots, if he thinks that I have to take a flight 737 to some country and that's it. And then some of us, well, I don't know about Indians, Bangladeshis, they have the, some Bangladeshis have the audacity to migrate to a foreign country and then criticize Bangladesh from there. I say, bhai, if we have anything to do with Bangladesh, come and settle in Bangladesh and contribute here. Don't be a know all from the USA or the UK and try to give us advice on how to run our country. I will not be surprised if you have people like this in India who are giving suggestions on how to run our country and how to do, what to do. So let us learn from our village. Let us take our uh, uh, youth and our village and our, you see the uh, resource that we have built, resource. So city dwellers have a wonderful idea of having a picnic or staying two days in the resort. So when they go to a resort, they find everything that they had in the house, everything. They will want everything that they have in, in, uh, in their house and they'll want even better food, better living conditions in their house. So what's the point? Some of the resorts are made of indigenous materials. You'll find that in India also, even in Bangladesh, we're having a few. They're made of local materials. But there are many resources which are lavishly made with marble, concrete, brick, aluminum, glass. It's a city in a village. In fact, they're destroying the village. So if we, if we have the mindset to do something for our village, to think like the village, to work like the village, maybe even in the city, we can do something which will be having a positive impact on our architecture. Thank you so much, sir. We can listen to you hours together, but uh, considering the time scarcity, remaining questions can be sent to email ID provided in the chat box. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much for having me. Greetings and salam from Bangladesh. Thank you. All right, moving over to the next speaker of the day, we have with us architect Krishna Rao Jaisal. Architect Krishna Rao Jaisal is a well-known personality in the field of architecture. He completed his university education in architecture since 1966 from Madras University. In 1970, inspired by the writings of the legendary Ayn Rand, he started practice under the title Jaisal Fountainhead. Professor architect Krishna Rao Jaisal has authored and presented over hundreds of papers which has been published in international, national, and state media, and has made over 1,500 presentations on issues regarding architecture on international, national forums, and multimedia. 
there are many awards like jk award architect of the year in 1992 international gold star millennium award in 2007 lifetime achievement award in 2007 for outstanding performance in the field of architecture awarded by paa riba recognition award in 2017 and many more to his credit i would like to welcome architect jason on board to talk on future of reurbanization over to you sir Namaskars. Welcome to Cottage One Two Six. Thanks to Ambala MM University, Message, and Ethos. Welcome you to Subida. When you called and talked about the subject that we had to discuss, I was a little overwhelmed. As we come into this outskirts of Bangalore city, and talking about a subject which I am relenting to go or having left it after about five to six decades of practice and work in the hardcore urban cities, when I moved to this place. I designed this place about 15 years back, and then last three years living here continuously. It was a tremendously changing experience from an extremely dense active spaces to suddenly come to literally zero active spaces, but active in different sense. Nature. Hugged me here. Their nature would just smile at me and run away. There, it was pure technology taking over, taking over the arts, running our lives. Here, I find it's another fascinating synthesis of nature, arts trying to synthesize with technology and creating a new awareness of life. But. There is a very fascinating happening. We architects need to work or require to work with live projects. That is when we create the spaces. But then we need human activity. I here fundamentally believe that the human being is one being, the thinking being, who can never be alone. He needs communication. He needs activity. She needs activity. She has to interact. That is what happens when that interaction happens. There is that sense of moving towards a particular area of what I would call as today we call it as urbanization, or what we call it civil society, or moving to a place of order. What appeared to be order of nature is suddenly chaos, and all proportion of chaos becomes order. It's a very fascinating process of thinking that happens. And then, once people come together, something else happens. In the beginning, from here, what I felt, the people who come to here had certain identities which search for this place. I'm looking at it as one of the early settlements that could have happened four thousand or ten thousand years back. But because it's in the 2020s, how things have changed. That what took hundreds of years now today evolved within a matter of years, or sometimes even months. I would like you to have a look around the place, hammer it, and see it. Then we will take a walk around, not just the physical space, but the real space of human thinking and process. 
how urbanization is something that has that is part of human living but when at this point i would look at it in a very very different way if you look back at the subcontinent then you look back at the rest of the world you find a very fascinating difference in spite of centuries and thousands of years of people coming and moving and influencing us from various aspects from various directions this subtle past the subtle culture the subtle history of this diversity of the subcontinent continues even today nothing has really managed to alter it people today morning i had a talk said why are we talking english it is a very fascinating thing till i got back into the uh, uh, dialogue with that person to say what is english it's a communication who discovered it? the romans the british of europe one thing we found this language to be more communicated to the world than the other languages who knows what will happen next now a new language is coming a new language is approaching for the first time in this world today we are reaching a stage of something which history has never imagined could happen not with the 2019 covid here i would like you to pass and look beyond what you can keep silence more make sure the taste it works please welcome yourself and walk into the reorganization of spaces which we dreamt of and try to organize the one who would like to see this case have a look at it these are all the observations people have made for the last decade you can go near if you want watch the fun various categories of people all over the country and the earth world coming around making me various things this is purely the human aspect of wanting to remember one's journey but these are beautiful collections given by the various urban spaces of the various countries wherever i visited either giving them a talk or something philosophers saints religious leaders politicians schools of architecture schools of design all of them you are now welcome to take a walk right up there have fun how humans can live also get isolated I deliberately kept a little silent during the talks because in silence comes many things. You would have seen the beautiful book of Pranayama and Gandhi, the Living Gandhi book. Like the Institute of Architects, others appreciate sometimes what we do. 
But whole aspect is about human civilization, human organization. One of the reasons why I'm taking this opportunity to discuss with you people or dialogue with you people is the fact that finally India is emerging as a very powerful state. The subcontinent has emerged into a different atmosphere. We will go into it slowly later as to what we think. Remember, for the first time, the earth has come together and separated together. They can't touch you, but yet you won't fight me. The small fights are sorted out. Everybody is following certain principles of COVID. Is COVID bad, or COVID good, or is it something very divine? Yes, everything has is what we sacrifices because the good and evil, or what you call yin and yang, I won't call it good and evil, also the yin and yang is very important to life. It's like two sides of a coin, or three sides of a coin, whatever you call it. It is very, very crucial. I feel sometimes I should sit upstairs here and think about my subjects of architecture. Sometimes I feel I should go out into the streets and walk around. Walking interaction is something. The thinking interaction is something. Philosophizing is something. India is basically more as a philosophizing subcontinent. When I use the word India, it means the subcontinent, the entire subcontinent. That is very important. We are a people about one and a half billion sitting in one of the most nurtured spaces on earth, unlike any other country or any other area in this space. Now, to make this more definite, we will slowly maybe take a little walk, sit outside. As you can see in the background, some pictures will be running of what we have done to this. Then we look at reorganization again, the delivery. I'm not talking about deorganization. I'm going to talk about reorganization. I would like you to have again a pause of silence to think about this. While walking through these spaces, one of the reasons this space intrigues me when they said we'll be free of power and have our own wind energy and solar energy to back us up. We thought we can get away from the urban reliance on very much on hydroelectric power and other things. Take the buggy also. You will find these electric means of walking through is our communication that happens with us. Again, an electric alternative urbanization, this was a factor which really proved. But then, it's a very subtle factor. To run that, I have to have power, which means I must generate that power somewhere. It's back to urbanization. I can't, it's a beautiful sandalwood tree, beautiful, one of the rarest trees, another fellow here, beautiful green spaces. Let's walk it out. Hmm. This is what I said, can urbanization be a factor? Not one thing, I don't mind you. Uh, urbanization be a factor of people living in quiet isolation. Yes, I find it is possible, but then as I said earlier, human beings lead a lead of interactivity. What is this happening between you and us now? It's an interactivity. Here's an young person really shooting. Without him, can I take anything? Without the technology, can I communicate? These are very important issues that we must remember. That is technology. And that, taken through art, fuses into architecture. And not architecture demands urbanization. The only aspect that we are looking at is can we look at reurbanization? I will talk to you as we go. Settlements are made by human beings, but very often in the last couple of hundred years back, people thought they could design the cities. That is, they pre designed the cities. 
and then people will go and settle in there. I've been watching this over a period of eons of time. Top beautifully designed cities. I won't name anyone in particular. You will realize after you walk in, none of them have sustained or survived in the design emphasis in which, under which they were designed. There are many examples even in India too, the subcontinent. There are examples outside. There are examples in various other continents. None of them have sustained. Whereas you take Europe, you take Asia, you take the Indian subcontinent, you take many of these organic cities that have evolved over time. They have evolved, organically grown. Yes, there will be chaos, but in the chaos, a sense of order comes. Because once people come together, there is business, there is activity, there is entertainment. There are so many levels of work, hierarchies of work that happen. This is what an urban designer's challenge is. But can he design it? He can architecture it, but he can't design it. That has been my fundamental belief. You can talk about it. You can say this is where the road is in this little colony where we design. We find we put a road and something else happens. Because that fellow finds it more convenient to walk this way. Whereas the design said go that way. So something happens. You can even have a laugh sometimes. And you thought the tree will grow this way. It is growing the other way. I'll take you to another morphous space here. We thought initially we would build this vertically. Yes, I'll come to that as another talk chapter or unit of this talk. Vertical growth, horizontal growth, there are various aspects of it. But as I talk you, walk you through this horizontal growth, because the 15 to 20 percent of the land that talk price with a good number of people finally living. We thought they'll all be retired people, but sometimes I find the more people who enjoy this most are the young ones. They play around, fool around, but we hold them back in a sense of discipline, which is not really, discipline is not really design. It thinks it's design. Architecture just smiles at both, but a civil engineering wants to do discipline, or any engineering wants to discipline. This is where we should start looking at factors. Look at the change from an open space, you have come to a covered natural space. Trees grow, trees get literally murdered or massacred by human beings. They just smile and grow again and then take us with us. Now I'll take you to another fascinating part of the elements which open our lives and then I want you to pass, have a look at within yourself about how one can think of the urban factor. We walk down this path, all this land that was around, the rains came, the waters flew, and the waters joined and we have our lake in the space. This water is our own water, but water is an essential part of human living. It makes a lot of sense for people. <laughs> I think they, uh, they come in the evening set, the fish comes, the birds come, the butterflies come. That is human living. Can that be brought? as urbanization factor. Yes, in Bangalore we have Lalbagh, we have Kabban Park, we have so many parks. But then what does man want? Here we have another very senior person walking down. Very interestingly, he is the son-in-law of the environmentalist. He is probably talking environmental. <laughs> Science. 
you can picture this whole place. It's all man-made, but we've left it to nature. Sometimes it's good not to have too much money. If you have money, they start decorating it. <laughs> Here we have left the wild nature to conquer and really bring back some things, except we're looking for some security and safety. <laughs> this is what inspired us from almost all the people who occupied this part from dense cities. When they saw the land, it was barren, just rockery. And we had literally created a green forest here. But then human beings are human beings. They can never forget the urban factor and the urban what I call it the conveniences of a different nature. This Savita of convenience is natural convenience. But you can't get the deliveries that they can give you there. Here, the deliveries are something else. Hmm? Cut off for some time. deliberately showing to you under the title of reurbanization because very few people realize these were all hardcore within the urban cycle or I would say just beyond the urban cycle of Bangalore but before the ring road before the nice road this is where I keep saying that you can't leave men away it was just a rockery, somber. Of course, yes, there were other nature things and so on. But when soft human intervention comes, you can really create an urbanization. Now, people don't believe we are in Bangalore City. They don't believe at all. They think I'm in some resort or somewhere far away. No, it, it has become a point of envy, typical human being, thinking is, oh, this can be done. Why not there? Why not here? Yes. In one way I agree, in one way I say no. You can do this only if you have people coordinating and cooperating with you. And then have the sense of imagination to be part of an architecture, of the environment. This is what I'm calling reurbanization. Can this be done in small areas? Yes. Can this be done in large areas? Yes. Can it be done in vertical spaces? Yes. But that sense of nature integrating with the urban civilized factor. You can even hear the plane roaring on top. Yes, they are part of life. You can't say, I don't want aeroplanes. I don't want them. That is my communication. Sure, sir?
sometimes that is what makes life. You may think it is disturbing nature. Yeah, that is human. He has brought it here. He has brought my communication. Yes, during this COVID period, sky is cleared. I say, I do not disagree. Which means nature is telling us in a very subtle way, you can subtly balance things. You can certainly work with this side and that again and go back to the yin and yang or our Indian version of looking at the totality of factors, the three dimension, five dimensional, I put fact sometimes seven dimensional factors. But the coin is only two dimensional or three dimensional because the edge is also a dimension. When you look at seven dimensions, when you work with the system, look at the can't see it gone behind the cloud. It's a very fascinating factors that we collected we made the tributaries work with this this is a total what I would call a way of looking at things suppose what somebody said suppose we had given you a larger budget larger thing what would have happened sometimes it's a challenge of lack of budget that makes things happen whereas if there was budget we would have had super tropical roads we would have had so many fascinating trees which look more like garden of the palaces rather than of nature kind in spite of it we have challenges facing us on these aspects which we take on i'm glad during a little rain we look at the grass behind it really really gross world but then human nature take the beautiful tree which is absolutely without things human nature many things come slowly nearer i'll show you one of the greatest factors of human life here you see all those ants, they think they're eating the tree. No, they're actually cleaning the tree. And once they clean and the sprouts, leaves come back, lives come back. This is reurbanization of a very different fact. This is what should happen to cities also. I'll show you, I forgot to show you the ant pit. There's one, there's three, one. Somewhere behind. I always look at an anthill as an example of city, urban space. Imagine the ant's ability to climb that anthill, which is 1,000 times or more its size, and it climbs faster than any elevator we have ever invented in our lives. And it comes down and goes up. We can't even do it. When can that technology reach us? It can. Because the human being has the ability to do it, ability to to get across time in the sense of space. I usually use the sense of space and time interactively as the urbanization factor. It is really, really uh, one of human beings, imagination and innovation. And looking at history. So this reurbanization, this COVID space, yes, it has taken its sacrifices, it has taken its things, but this quiet space is when architects unable to go into the real physical world can do a lot of thinking, can a lot of creative thinking. And then this time will be the essence of a seed which can create fantastic. These are opportunities for young students, young architects, young environmentalists to take advantage of. Yes, you feel lonely you feel let off, but we are learning a sense of what I would call a distance learning or interaction without touching, all sorts of things are happening. For the first time, technology is fusing with the arts and human habitation. I use the word human habitation as an ecologist, as an acoustics person, to understand the behavior of human lives. There is one more chapter which I'll talk to you. And I said for the urbanization factor, which is opening up to us. There are cities which are called tall cities, and the cities that are called suburban or sub underground cities. These have been two of my great major dreams, which we will slowly take as the next talk as we open another chapter. Hmm?
Hello. Yes, sir, we can hear you. You can hear me? Okay. You can see? Absolutely, Hello. sir. Absolutely, okay. sir. Now, what is in the main frame? Should I put that as the main frame? Can you hear me now? Perfect, yes, sir. Perfect. All right. Uh, I thank MM University for letting me walk through this fabulous place. Even now, you hear the birds and the plane even now flying over me across this Subida. MM University and HH, thank you very much for this fascinating project. Last two days and today morning has been invaluable to me in learning from phenomenal minds, the nature of things that have happened and are happening. What I would like to take across is something else. I'm looking at rediscovering cities, the future of cities. We are all very aware of the population of the earth. I was looking at various factors like, can human beings live in the sea? Then I realized working on the sea, once you go below 30 feet, it becomes almost impossible to live as an organism of that part. Something else happens. The depth of the water, although three fourths of the earth is made of water. We can only make use of it, but not live in it, but totally sustainable. But we may be able to live on floating cities and top the sea. Then came the other idea, look into the urban factor itself. I found one thing very obvious, that is about the existing big cities. They are not possible to redo or rediscover or what you call as redesign the cities. In my earlier talk, as I was walking around the lake, I told you that all the large urban designs that were done in the last 200, 300 years, done by phenomenal architects and urban designer planets, have all collapsed because you cannot pre-design the living habitat of a human being or a center of people. Because the ethos of the person, the culture of the person changes and not one person can design for such a human community, including our, some of our very well designed cities have collapsed over time. What is possible and what you can think as an evolving factor is the organic process. You always notice even now the big cities that have been there, which have been totally designed, one step you go beyond the boundaries of the city, you will find the organic format coming back again. This is another big factor of the suburban continent, much more than the European continent and the Americans, because we are a culture which is much, much older. We are a very diverse people and together. Many people go abroad, come back, and why don't we have order? We cannot and we don't want that order because in our chaos is the order. Nowhere else do we have such fascinating diversity that takes us on and on. This is why one of the challenges I've taken upon myself as purely as an architect and in, involved in the human aspect of life is not even involved in the first level city and the second level city, but the third and fourth level villages. When I started looking at this place and designing it as a village, as what we call the Subida retirement village for senior people, we got all the permissions, minimum occupancy, luck, water, power, everything. Over a period of time, I find human beings are human beings. They need interaction and they need diversity within themselves. Otherwise, it is more like a paid prison. We are just there. That should not happen. What should happen is communication. What should happen is some sort of what I would call as unbelievable fascinating thing one to work with. You can't diversify, separate old people, young people, children separating. It is not possible and it does not work. The same thing also happens with different types of people. When we talk of villages, villages have come over many, many years. But today, due to technology, due to the urbanizing factor, something else is happening. The technology has brought mobility like cars, communication, and etc. What do they do? They also want it. 
You can't tell somebody out there, you cannot have a car, you will have a cycle. Cycle is very nice. I was talking to some people on Cycle City yesterday and somewhere else when you talked about it. It's all very interesting. You can have electric cycles, like we have your electric cabs here, but we need to charge them, we have to look after them. We need a manufacturing sector, we need a manufacturing center. The other factor that is very much which make, sits on my head all the time is within the next 20 to 30 years from this five to seven billion population we are going to reach 15 billion population or more within 20 25 years we are going we need to do something and another factor that impresses on this factor is what will these relatives happen very understandingly you notice that less people today can farm the same land which many people did. And all these villagers would like to have the living standards of the urban city. It took me some time to make the villager understand that his lifestyle is far more interesting, what I would call more in depth. But then he looked at our projects, our buildings, he said, but I also want that. So we started interacting with many of them and started redesigning many of them in such a way that they get the benefit of this and that. In fact, they get the better. They get our technology and they get their art. There's something fusing happened to a point. Now my urban fellows say, can I have that house in the city? But as like the earlier speakers said, you can have, but your land is too expensive. Your land is too constrained. Your land is too limited for factors of happening. Another very big exercise that came is, okay, let us say if you're looking at some cities, what would happen? If you would happen, what would the villagers do? Where do they go for entertainment? Where do they go for meeting people? You can't meet your own family 24 hours a day. Now, human beings are not made for isolation. Human beings not just act, but they must also think. In fact, I would say they must think and then act. Many places, the action happens and thought comes afterwards. That is not very good. The action must happen only after the thought process. But just thinking and keeping silent does not work. That's what happens with most architects and have been designed. We must get to an interaction. The other big aspect that I would like is history is fine, culture is fine, but do we evolve something for the future? Do we evolve something for our own self? This is where I like to call it. COVID has finally put a very silent halt in front of all of us and said, look back, look forward, think again. Yes, it has its payment of lives, payment of isolation in one manner and consolation in another manner. But that has made me relax and think very often, what do I do with this time? This is where universities like MM and your people like HH can put factors of media in together and say, think more positively. One of the main things that have been controlling people is politics and power. Can this politics and power merge within the people? It can happen up to a point. Can it become the influencing factor to understand human lives? I feel it can, because if the people get the power to understand and then have the leaders that can lead them in the right way, because once they lead, you should not blindly follow. Unfortunately, the blind following is happening very much here. Some, a decade or so back ago, just like Suvida, the neighborhood, we took over another neighborhood, which had a couple of neighborhoods, thanks to Hutko and other factors. We designed overall about 300 to 400 acres of land, took them isolation. We had small spaces, large spaces, meeting spaces, what we call residential areas, non-residential, semi-residential areas. For about 10 years, it worked, but as you understand when things become very interesting and important and people start getting attracted to it, the place, the commercial value goes up. So what happened, where was a ground floor building, a two floor building, a three floor building comes. Sometimes people build edge to edge and build one over the other. So this concentration of population, you cannot stop. You can put rules and rules and rules, but people are people. There are various categories of people that happen to do it. The other big factor that I would like to look at people is, what I will look at is the underground. I was about to go in my walk. 
You can build skyscrapers, you can build other skies. My major address today is, I hope I have the time enough to say, I want people to look going underground. This I learned in a very fascinating way. First I learned it in Egypt when I looked at the mountains, which is 3,000, 5,000 years ago. Then I came to Andhra Pradesh, some driver and one neighbor took me to one underground little passageways, these beautiful little things. Then I went to New Zealand and Australia, I saw some. Then I went to Europe and London, I found everywhere. I found absolutely fascinating, whatever you call these people, many people call these things, you walk below. And they are naturally made. I thought they were all naturally made. Then once, about 10 or 15 years back or something like that, I was driving to Rishi Valley, which is my favorite architectural project. When the driver stopped me, I said, there is a very nice temple for you to have a look at. He just took me up the temple. He knew me because he used to drive me every month. So I went up to the temple. The pujari there looked at me, talked to me. He said, very nice. Then the driver whispered something to him. He whispered, so can you come and do the puja from the inside? Very few people are allowed inside the puja. He took me backside, his wife was also there. I, I'm not a great believer in pujas and things, but anyway, as a respect, they said something. But after that, he smiled, and then he said, when you turn around, sir, I turned around. There was nothing, there was one big hillock behind me. There's nothing, I could see nothing. Then he moved to one corner. There was a big stone. He said, sir, can you, I said, there is nothing. He said, please come. Just enough for a human being to walk through there with a stone. I walked him. And I walked 10 feet, believe it or not, I've never seen a bigger cave in my life. There were half a dozen, dozen people working on the roofs and the skyways. He said, who are all these people? So they've been working here for the last 20, 30 years. They live here. He called them cavemen. No, they could talk English. They could talk any language. Children, little running around there could talk. It was a beautiful ecothermal space. Then he took me up a little ledge, up in the ledge where he, the families lived. They could even work toilets inside, working water, water was collected from the top. These were unimaginable spaces. And I thought there was only one or two like this. I mean, one, there are many. These is when my mind went back and said, when you live below 30 feet below water, you get into density. It kills you. But when you go 30 feet below the earth, the atmosphere is ecothermal. And if you go even deeper, Many people forget there is a thermal effect within the earth itself, which can give you heat and light. This is again what I noticed when I went to Australia once, when they took me to the offsite mountains. And when I climbed the mountain, they said, just smiled and said, you are talking, sir, in the university, Australian University the other day. We knew you would like this. We very few people will show this. It was a beautiful city in the mountain. People living there, but yes, they had cars, they had auto riches. They're all kept along, quietly in one corner down there, they go down. In fact, one of them even had a lift inside, in this urban site. This is when my inspiration came in to write that article called The Future of Cities, which I said, connecting mountains to mountain with underground, high speed, low speed, or whatever you want, transportation. Creating an aspect of the entertainment in one major, then living and other workspaces around it, satellite. This is only one type. There can be multi-type of factors here because depending on the design, depending on the people, depending on the ethos, they must change. Then what happens? The cycle happens, which means you don't disturb the cover of the earth at all. You live within this mountain. The only people who might get disappointed are 3D drawing people because there's no three-dimensional drawings to project and share. There's nothing to show for those people. Then what you see, I thought to light, no, with this new technology of fiberglass, getting power to you at any point, light to you at any point, visuals at any point, unbelievable. I mean, lately I found some few people also trying to live on this aspect of trying small uh, experiments going on recently. This is another big factor that I would like to look at in the thing I call it ecothermal cities. The other factor that one starts looking at this is nature then smiles at you. Because when you dig and move into these mountains, you get a lot of earth. You get a lot of other minerals. I was yesterday reading one factor on the New York Times. There is a big dust going on top of North America. Where did the dust start from? 
from Africa and beyond. What is this dust made of high expensive minerals? This happens almost every two years or three years. People call it dust. No, this is the moving of the oceans, moving of the continents that makes this dust drop and fall everywhere. It scatters gold and diamonds and other phenomenal minerals all over. We call it the wealth of dust. This aspect brings me again to another factor of looking at the various aspects of what I would call as, uh, what would you call living habitats that encourage human beings to learn. In fact, I find seeing all that I've not learned anything at all, but there's so much in the ethos of the people on these things. People think, well, they just don't know, they just know. The way of learning is something else. But the aspiration for technology to get to their lifestyle is very important. This is where I look to see the urbanization factor happen in a very interesting manner. Somebody else also mentioned to me the other day, so that a lot of young people today work 24 seven and they don't care where they live, where they are, as long as they get a burger to eat or something to work, they keep working. I said, no, that is where we should start interacting with them and asking them to see something more of life. I hardly, I very strongly believe that each human being is an individual. These individuals of some sort of a similar mind come together to make a community, but nobody should force the community with the head on top. They should work as an interactive space. Then what happens with this type of people activity is the culture evolves to a much higher level. There is no national boundaries. That is what is tying us up now. Yes, there will be interest for warfare and all this, but this warfare can be like the old days, fighting one to other on a dialogue and a little physical rather than killing each other. The, I wish they could go on for this, these neighborhood cities, these neighborhood factors, if they conglomerate can happen. Then again, I smiled and said, when I came to Bangalore in the 1980s, my father gave me some land of the ideal homes cooperative society. And we had what are called beautiful neighborhoods around Bangalore, beautifully done, beautifully done. But within a matter of 15, 20 years, all the neighborhoods merged within the major city and it became the large Bangalore urban metropolis to a point of total chaos in some factor. But it's chaos to the older people like me and most of the talk. But when you talk to the younger souls, that is some of the life. Look at even this factor today when I look at it, great difficulty after 20 years or 30 years delay, they put the metro rail. But when we really want the metro rail, it is closed because one person doesn't trust the other person. This sense of civilization should also happen. That is only a learning process. The holding that people said, then I met another community said, we teach children at home. It looks nice for some time, but when children don't interact with other children, when old people don't interact with children, life is not there. It could be in the prison, it could be somewhere thrown on the some island out there. That is also not the urbanization. The reurbanization factor is can we make not just the media, but these great builders look at it in a very different way? Can we make the builders responsible not just for making money? Finally, I find that all holding back after this chaos. But can each human being interpret or explain or in, in a way that place he lives, the expression outside and inside, expresses the individual? That is very, very crucial. The identity of the person is very important. That's what makes humans different from animals, birds, and other creatures. You look at anthills. The anthills are the same type of body, but no two anthills are the same. But there is a character that makes it the same. Same with bird's nest, same with other bees' nests and everything. Same thing can happen in a human being that the ethos of the person, the culture of the person has an identity, but everywhere the diversity can happen because human beings are so diverse. That to me is a very, very crucial aspect of life in the future of rediscovering cities. How do you rediscover cities? Because I'm confident within 30 years or 40 years maximum, 80% will be living in urbanized factors. The other big factor that really kills me and I see is when this huge con connecting what you call big roads are built between big cities, they 
drive through villages. They drive to small rural urban spaces. With no kindness, they literally bifurcate them and then scold them for crossing the road on the road, which means there has been no planning. The bureaucracy and the planners today are incapable of understanding the ethos and the culture of the people working in the village. We were once talking about this in another sector when we were looking, why can't one move from place, one place to another place with a lot of time and enjoy the journey rather than kill the journey? This is what I have been talking, had been talking in the other talk that was going on. Those who want to communicate faster, they can go in an underground system of train or they can go on an aircraft or a helicopter and go. Why should these connecting roads be six lane, 20 lane roads? They can be just walkways or literally crawling ways where you can have even your motor cars or trains that come. Here it comes to me an example which about 15 years back, before we destroyed the rounds or whatever you call the rounds in the major in Bangalore city. We had a very, very serious discussion of the Bangalore Agenda Task Force, which said we will limit the speed of cars to 15 to 20 kilometers per hour everywhere. And we will not have any traffic lights. We will not have any lanes. Maximum speed is with no honing, nothing. If there is a pedestrian walking, you'll slow down. If you want to go very fast, you go on the ring road and go to the airport or do something. But within the city, you will move at a very slow speed. The thinking we tried it in one spot, it worked well, except there are always some odd people who come and say, I have bought a car for some clothes of rupees. I want to try 100 kilometers an hour. I want to do it. Those are the people who affect this. This is again where, when I heard President Nas talking, it's very easy to design for certain things. It looks very glamorous and fantastic, but does it fit all types of human beings? Does it come to, can I dominate another human being and say, you will do this, you will do this? Can't. How can this be resolved? How can this be brought into a understanding between various characters of people? Some just go to buy and come. Some take the walk as a part of their living. Some don't want to do any of these things. How does one do this? This is the challenge that the human faces in the future. This is, if you call it realist, this is when the answer came from another sector from what is called the vertical city people. They said, this is where the vertical city problem starts. You have a couple of lips, one goes short distance, one goes long distance, and we don't occupy space. In the beginning, I was looking at this sprawling city, when they came with the big, very interesting argument, put everybody in one dense area and open up the big space. I said, what a beautiful solution, but two. The third person going underground, which means straight away we have one, two, three, four categories that happens. Another fifth person who came up to me and we smiled and worked it out together for a couple of weeks together. We said, if you put all human beings in just one project, all of the people in the earth, plus the next 30 years of development of what growth factor would happen, control of what would happen. We found giving all the convenience for the person we could put all the 7 billion people plus in a 50 kilometer by 50 kilometer space in any one space, giving them playgrounds, shopping grounds, and all of them within three floors above, two floors below, which means they have communication lining. If they want to go, they go. The rest of the earth belong to your green space or whatever you might call a green, blue, right? but it belongs to the earth. You can go there and enjoy, you have your picnic, you have your fight, but within this, you will not climb, you will walk. I managed to convince small builders to do smaller, about 100 acres, 20 acres in this type of working. They all look at it, but will it survive? Yes, small neighborhoods can manage to survive. It will happen, which big examples, like the whole of human habitat come. Okay, instead of having one habit, I'm just taking as an example, one habitat. In that's a habitat which can be brought into each continent. Could it not happen? Yes, but, that will be going to 1984, that great Oscar Wilde's novel, Control. It will help for some time. But the moment somebody plans for you, it collapses. That is what happened to all the major cities that were over-designed like Chandigarh and beyond, which don't work at all. You want to cross the street in Chandigarh, you have to wait, you don't even know which sector, what is the sector? Names of places have gone. You are calling them like prison, you are ward number 20 or ward number 10 or prisoner number 30. That really shook me back. It really hurts. 
that the identity of the human being, where every human being is individual, is so important. Not he should be. And again, remember, the human being is the only being when born, he or she knows nothing. And when he dies or she dies, he or she takes nothing. But during that lifespan, everything matters. Life matters, movement matters, communication matters, learning matters. All that he can't live alone. No human being can live alone. He says, I will go on out into the Alps or go into the Himalayas and live. They are all only talking, they only want to run away. And when they go, they meet other saints, other people and join them together and go. Where will they eat? Who will cook? Who will feed them? Who will give? You know, the Rishis are all very clever people who just want to take a walk somewhere out. They're all searching. This search will happen. But as long as we understand, we human beings need the convenience of meeting other human beings, interacting with others all the time. And fighting is not physically, try not physically, at least mentally and dialoguing. We can draw into a phenomenal place. Like it will be the villages that become the cities, but of a higher dense area. I will not take much more time on this. I would rather answer any other questions that people have, if they have any, because it took some time to put all these together into a lot of factors. Now, uh, <laughs> India is a growing thing, but I don't want to look at India as India. I want to look at it as India as a subcontinent. It is a fascinating elixir of life that is coming. Let us organically grow. Let us find order in the chaos. Let us find tomorrow a better place to live, a better place to learn, so that learning becomes continuous. It's not necessary for colleges and schools. I still believe in simple of JK's philosophy, just learn, move. You will move. If other wants to learn, they might come with you. Otherwise, you just keep on going. It works and it'll be unbelievable to work this type of lifestyle. Where you walk, with, you walk by yourself. Now others happen to come on the journey, fine, but you walk by yourself. Can such a thing happen in the urban factor? I believe it can. I believe that communications can happen when necessary by yourself, not forced, can happen. People are different categories. Each one will find a different space of life to live with. There are contradictions. Yes, contradictions is what make people happen to live. People happen to make life better. Boredom is only there because when you don't know what to do. But when you know there is something alternative to do, something else to catch up, creativity happens. When creativity happens in the silence, it's unbelievable. That's why the five elements and the five senses, when you fuse them, there is an end to it. This earth may go to Mars in the next future, it may go to the moon next future, it may go underground, but it's going to grow and grow. I have tremendous faith in the youngsters that are going to follow. We were all old people talking about, they may have better answers, better ways of direction, better ways of discoveries. I am confident that they will find, technology will find them answers, art will guide them in a way, both fusing together and architecture will smile. We are the only profession who are not hands-on. We are the only profession that can smile and look at our projects grow without doing anything. Just imagine, and you have a draftsman drawing, a builder building, and somebody else paying for it, and then you enjoy it. That is architecture. I think architecture is the rediscovery of cities. Namaskars, and thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. Hello. Yes, sir. That was indeed a very gripping session. Uh, thank you for your magnificent and thought-provoking presentation, sir. Thank you for giving a tour of your cottage. We were delighted to watch. It is indeed beautiful. I'm sure what we've learned from you here today will remain with us throughout. Uh, we have many questions uh, here. Uh, I'll read out to you, sir, the first question. Sir, many of our listeners want to know about the caves you mentioned, the one near the temple complex and the cave city in Australia. Oh, which country? So the cave city it, in, in Australia? Oh, yeah. no, it, it's not Australia. It's here in India. That is different. The one, the temple oh, yes. is behind near in Kuala. All right, sir. I don't know whether I'm allowed to talk about it because I was sworn to secrecy about it. But <laughs> he, he said nobody should know. They have special permission from the thing. But everybody is very clever. 
when you are driving from Bangalore to Andhra Pradesh and to Rishi Valley School, we take off near Kolar, you take off left diversion. After some time, you'll find a bad place. A great, very close to that was a very fascinating British architect who lived there, but who didn't have his citizenship and he had to fight, I forget his name. He was sort of a, became a good friend. There, if you go, you'll suddenly find a pathway of steps going and you'll find hidden one white temple on top. That is the space. If anybody's adventurous, he, he or she can go quietly find catch somebody in Rishi Valley School. They might know <laughs> exact location, but it's absolutely phenomenal. I couldn't believe it. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm sure, sir. So. Let's take another question, sir. Yes. You have mentioned about various dynamic factors which develop when some built up structure is designed. So what design approach or method you find ideal for designing buildings in urban settings? Very interesting way of looking at it. The first thing I'll answer the person who's asked is, do not, for heaven's sake, imitate another building. Do not, for heaven's sake, imitate history in your facade or anything. Look at your client, look at the lens, and then look at your neighbors. Very important, look at your neighbors, because they're the ones who are going to occupy the windows, the doors and things. I wish the government would reconsider the bylaws and say you can build wall to wall, as long as you don't open your window to the neighbor and you provide your own lighting system to within the space you create. They should not interfere with that. When I mean, they say plant two trees in front, fine, you have four cars, you find a way to put it in. You do all that thing, but that should happen. The British way of looking at setbacks and things has killed the architecture in the urban context. Even now, you look at many things, 30, 40 site, the law only provides you to build ground plus one, but everywhere you go, it's four floors, five floors, because as the earlier speakers, and the economics matters. You can't build, you can build spaces in the urban context in a very interesting. In the earlier period, we used to have, the, this is, opens up another subject that from the, you go to the parks. What are they? This is when you need a park. No, the parks are all locked during daytime. What is the fun of the having the park? The small neighborhood parks. They're not, there's where people used to walk. No, they open for some time and close. It doesn't make sense. These are things that must come. We used to have small parks, small spaces, slightly larger spaces from the big center space. These are called neighborhood designs within the larger city. That type of thinking, that small group, larger group, medium group, and the bigger group can all interact. How they design on the roof, on the side, that's left to the individual planner and the individual architect and the group of people. But it is very important to make people interact. I love some of the old cities where everybody walked around in small, small gullies, not straight gullies. Gullies are so organic, moving here and there and there. It was fascinating. These Western way of looking at straight lines killed India. Yep. Thank you for answering that one, sir. We have another question. Incorporating silence seems possible in suburbs and rural areas, but how can one get this experience within the dense cities? Can you tell me the first, second word you used? Incorporating silence seems possible in suburbs silence. and rural areas. Silence. Silence. Very interesting. Uh -huh. Good point. I'm trying to, in this cottage of mine, when I'm alone, you saw the plane was flying on top and the birds were singing. <laughs> that, that lady cleaning the place came and started moving, cleaning around the place. What can I do? I'm just looking at it and smiling. Uh, silence, you can, I was told by a very great philosopher, silence is within you. If you know how to keep silent, even at the maximum of noise and prayer outside, you can be silent within yourself. That's the greatest thing about a human ability to look at oneself. I believe one must learn to learn to have violence within oneself. The entire distraction outside you goes away. Tell whoever asked this question, learn to learn silence. Yep. Very well answered, sir. Another question. <laughs> we had lots to learn from our ancestors and from nature, but here we are what we are. 
so when more villages turn to cities what do you feel they should be like in fact this is where i'm concentrating as i was telling in my talk i'm not concentrating in bangalore or the first level cities at all i love my villages when i go there and work with them and then when they start realizing that you are interested in talking to them interested in dialogue with them and that you have a certain way of looking at things and that not just repeating what you have done in the city unfortunately 90% of the architects go to the villages take some example from the city and dump it on these villages which is very sad you'll find many villages are building three floors two floors ridiculous in that building i wish i had the pictures from i don't know whether they were there or not the fact is once you tell them they are a very organic lot even if they believe in religion or vastu and all this thing and tell them how to reinterpret those spaces in the way they must i believe they learn and they agree and how they can densify how they can make people because remember now in the olden days everybody in the family worked in the village farmland and all today no very few of them work in the farmland they go into the city they go into the urban other factors there there will be a lot of communication that happens that the I, here i believe i strongly believe the old type of ruling which was there that the village headman which was elected by the people not by the caste or creed and then they interacted and said okay you're doing this you do this interesting the justice was important that type of life cycle must come not somebody sitting in delhi or calcutta or somebody telling you what to do or somebody sitting in bangalore telling you what to do the person must be with you if such things can happen in fact if you can break up small dense high dense areas and open up other spaces you will find something very interesting happen but again i must warn you we thought when we came to this place that we will all live isolated that we will live in what are called as commonly designed space identity but within the space you can do whatever you want that's why when i took you around you found the cottages are looking identical from the outside but from inside they were all individually different nobody owns anything that is our place we only have the right to live in it as long as we live so we share this whole space it works up to a point but our mindset has become so much in property ownership property ownership it does not let these things perform very well this is one factor that we have to come over take larger spaces and live as a what you call as a community of understanding and your life as an individual within your space 100% nobody can say you should live like this no but when you come out you live within the parameters of this this is difficult but we are trying and i hope more neighborhoods like this may come which will also have lots of other activities like education and other factors which can be done especially when i go to some colleges and universities unfortunately the architects are involved in these universities and college campuses a very urban i won't call them urban very city type they build nonsense they just build parallel 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 city buildings it doesn't make any sense there's zero organic design in them i really find 90% of our architects are just money makers yeah sir thank you for answering that one we'll take the last question for today why chandigarh is referred as a negative example when the ground reality is that it is the only city to have performed well and provide quality to its residents all the initiatives taken now in other cities have were incorporated much earlier in chandigarh including cycle tracks and pedestrian paths what is the particular failure of garden city are we talking about garden city concept sorry garden city and chandigarh city are very different garden city was the bangalore garden city concept the garden city was really bangalore bangalore before 1980s was the real garden city we had gardens everywhere organic garden unbelievable initially i went to chai was scared to talk in chennai because they're all super architects sitting there they'd kill me super quench even now i'm sure a couple of them are listening to me and i'm going to get murdered in the evening <laughs> uh, especially <laughs> challenge it things is going to call me <laughs> Prasanna, God, it doesn't matter. But why is it they call me every year to come there? I went. I tell you, simple. I know who is asking these questions. But Chavi paying me to see what else. As I told you, I liked the way it happened. I liked when I was staying in a hotel. They put me in a hotel. Then I came. Then this the boys, Wang Town Planning Architect, very naughty boys. They said, "Sir, we will meet you in the evening." 
I said, no, I'd like to walk out and then meet him. No, sir, we will meet. And they said, okay. I went. They came and I came out of the hotel. I was staying in a very nice, I won't say which hotel they will show me, I don't want. Came out and said, but where is the main road? But luckily the watchman heard me, sir, Udarhai. He said, yeah, hotel main road, no, no, sir. Well, Udarhai, yeah, you can't put gates here, so they pushed the gate on the other side. So the kitchen and all are on the main road. I decided I don't mind them in the backyard because the front yard, anyway, I got into the main road. Then suddenly these two boys came. Sorry, sir, we are late. We came. A couple of boys and girls from the university came. So we will take you take a walk. It was the evening. So we walked. Wide roads. I said, I want to go there. I said, no, sir, you can't cross here. You must go to zero crossing and you must cross there. I said, that how far? There. So we went all the way. I said, I would come back. Yes, I came back. So 100 feet wide road, we came. Then there was a shopping mall. We went, it was closed. When we went there, we went around. Then he said, they didn't tell me. Then they took me to the very organic shopping thing which still exists near the university. That was beautiful. Then after seeing all the other interesting buildings of great architect finish. That was very interesting. Then they said, we'll take you to the next uh, what a sector. So they took me to the next sector. And then I was looking around. I suddenly found nobody. Then one policeman or one guard Sir, up here, what are you doing? What are you doing? I said, I don't know what you're doing. What is it? What is it? What is it? Sir, you are in which sector? I didn't know what sector. What is the sector? Where are you in the sector? You can be arrested. You are walking alone. You can't. I said, what do you mean? Sector, sector. I have never heard of sector. I said, what is the name of this place? He said, no, sector 8, a sector, and some shopping center. Then when he was about to say, luckily I had the hotel card with me. Sir, you have to leave the hotel card. Immediately these two boys came from somewhere hiding, told him something, sent him up. Sir, we wanted you to discover Chandigarh by yourself. We have been telling this to our teacher that this, what you call as checkerboard design, does not fit India. We are organic people. Next day, believe it or not, another two set of boys and girls put me in a car, took me outside Chandigarh, just outside, to cross the border of Chandigarh. And there was low chaos and chaos and beautiful small street, vendors on the road, this on the road, city. I said, this is India. This is what we are. Everybody happy and laughing and saying, whereas there you got dug dug, everybody sitting smart and chanting out there. What for? Whereas luckily that lakeside, has somehow been taken over by the great man who died recently. That was very organic. That is the only place Chandigarh is life. The rest is all murdered, chopped up, left, right, center. Look at each building. Wait, I went, he oh, will ask me another. It, it survives because it is subsidized heavily and it is lived mainly by the bureaucrats and the powers that be. You take away the governor from that place you watch the fun next day. The governor met him also. He said, I enjoy. He said, you want to come in. Next day I was the chief guest. They didn't know I was the chief. <laughs> this is what happens. You take him off. As long as the man rules with an army rule, a command, it works. The moment you take, it will collapse in 24 hours. We can go on listening to you, sir, for hours. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> All right. Uh, after this, uh, okay, again, keeping the time constraint in mind, uh, remaining questions can be sent to email ID provided in the chat box. After this thought provoking presentation, we hereby conclude our third and final day of lecture series. I thank would you. once again like to thank all the eminent speakers and participants who joined us and made this effort a success. Thanks to one and all who directly or indirectly have contributed to the successful completion of the lecture series of ICRC 2K20. Hope you all were benefited with the three-day lecture series. Thanks for joining. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay positive. Thanks all of you for a fascinating time. All of you. Thank you so From much. From the university, sir. up to you. Good. Thank you, sir. Thank you.